Yeah, we are live. It is 650. <laughs> oh my gosh. 651. So I'm way early. Couldn't wait to talk to you guys. Tonight we're talking about some very cool stuff. I put a video up today on one of the comments I got, one of the many comments that I get whenever I do a centri centrifugal supercharger, especially if I do a comparison between a centrifugal blower, whether it's a Torque Storm, Vortec, Paxton, Procharger, whatever. I do a comparison between that and a turbo or really any other form of force induction that invariably has better boost response. Because if you look at a centrifugal blower, it doesn't matter what it is. It always has a rising boost curve. So down at, if you're one of those guys that wants to get in the throttle at 1,000 RPM, you know, go wide open throttle at 1,000 RPM, like you do all the time, meaning never, um, but if you get on the, it, go full throttle at 2000 RPM, you really should be downshifting and, and use the RPM range where it was designed. But if you got into full throttle at 2000 RPM on a centrifugal blower, it would make almost no boost. How do I know this? I'm a centrifugal owner. I mean, I, I, my Vortec Mustang had serial number 001. <laughs> I literally <laughs> had the first one. Actually, it came off somebody else's car, but the one of the owner's car. But I've, I have a lot of experience with testing centrifugal blowers. I like them. I, I loved the Vortec on mine. I have nothing but great things to say about all of my experiences with it. We ran it out at the Silver State. I ran it at the Foxtrot. I ran it for the top speed shootout for road and track. I mean, I drove this car everywhere. It worked out fantastic. And so in this video, I'll, I'll, I'll invariably get comments from guys who say, oh, you're just a turbo guy or you're just an LS guy or whatever things that they want to say to try to put me down, to try to elevate themselves, and yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> I like all forms of force induction. I think it's fantastic that we have more than one kind, because then you get to choose whatever you want. For a lot of guys, especially real high horsepower guys, and we've gone over this many times, if you have a centrifugal blower um, and you have limited traction, which you can with 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 horsepower, a centrifugal blower acts as an artificial form of traction control. Works very well. You can make a billion horsepower with any of them, so it's not a big problem. But the question is, and, what, and the comments that I always get whenever I run them, whether, you know, a Torque Storm or Pro <laughs> Powerdyne, whatever, um, is this. Okay, what if you sped the blower up, like, really fast, and then we know that it's going to make a lot of boost out at the top, because that's what happens, is they don't make very much boost down low, and they make a whole bunch at the top. What happens if you spin it really, really fast? It's going to make a lot at the top. Then you open the bypass valve. Araj, thank you very much. Then you open the bypass valve and then allow it to limit the amount of boost that it produces at the top. So you've elevated the top or elevated the bottom and you've limited the top in an attempt. This is the this is the theory to flatten out the boost curve. Centrifugal, like if you look at one corner of this thing to the other, that's how a centrifugal would go. It'd make very little, almost no boost down at the bottom, and it would go all the way up to making a lot of boost, like right up here, um, wherever the maximum engine speed is. What they want to do is take that curve that goes like this, and they want to go like this with it. That's a nice theory. And the thing is, it's hard to it's hard to communicate with some of these guys because they want to swear that that's possible to make a flat boost curve like a turbo has, and it's not possible. It is possible, however, to improve upon this rising boost curve, because if you put a different pulley on it, it makes more boost, and it makes more boost everywhere. The thing is, and I showed this in the video, and I thought it was a, I thought it was a fairly good example. When we, when we put a pulley on, when we put a pulley on a Kenny Bell or a 2650 Kong blower, or a 671, when you put a pulley on those, they make more power everywhere. Positive displacement, you know, number of, number of revolutions relative to the engine speed, all that. They make more boost basically everywhere. Centrifugal does that also, but because there's a big disparity in how much boost they make at 2000 RPM, the very first part of the RPM range, and 6500 or seven or eight or what, however high you're revving, it could be anything, there's a big disparity in how much boost they make here and then how much boost they make up here. So when you increase it, that sort of thing still comes into play. When you put a pulley on and you gain, 
let's say, three or four horsepower at the top. Unfortunately for centrifugal blowers, you also don't gain three or four horsepower at the bottom. And that's what a lot of these guys want it to do. And it doesn't. And, and it's not, I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about centrifugal blowers. Like I said, I have run hundreds of tests on pro chargers, which are, have always worked awesome. Vortec, Torque Storm, Powerdyne, <laughs> Paxton, even way back when they were doing the planetary gear drive heat generating version of the Paxtons. I've run this stuff way back. And they always do the same thing. And they work very, very well. Like I said, I drove my car for 85,000 miles and I loved it. And it worked fantastic. But the thing is, the thing that they don't do is they have a rising boost curve. <laughs> and they don't have a flat boost curve. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't work well. The thing is, the guys with the centrifugal blowers, whenever you they take that like as an affront, when you publish what the thing does from some low engine speed to some high engine speed, it's less down here and more up here. It always does that. And they don't like when you do that, especially they don't like when you compare it to something else that doesn't have that same kind of boost curve. So if you compare it to a positive displacement blower that has like a lot of positive displacement blowers on a lot of these applications have a rising boost curve too. Don't let them tell you that it's all in and it's just perfectly flat. A turbo, again, is only perfectly flat if you have a, a wastegate controller, like an electronic controller that maintains, like if you have it set at 10 pounds, it maintains 10 pounds. As soon as the turbo can spool up and make 10 pounds, it just is clipped with a wastegate, it makes 10 pounds. And, and, and that's what the, the centrifugal guys are trying to do. <laughs> and I thought that this is really cool. And I and I'm this is very awesome that I've learned about this just now. But these guys have been doing it for a long time, probably, and they know about it. So I got to learn a very cool phrase today, a just very cool description called cold gate. And I thought that that's awesome because it, you know, it's a toothpaste and it's a it's a description for what they're doing. They're cold gating it using a gate, a waste gate or blow off valve to eliminate some of the excess pressure at the top of the RPM range and controlling the boost with this thing. And it's not new. I mean, way back and I, when I was running World Challenge in a Mustang, um, PD Cunningham and the, and the real-time guys in the NSX, they were allowed to run a Vortex supercharger in their, in their NSX because they're racing against guys that have lots and lots of power. And the NSX was a good car and handled well. And PD obviously knew how to drive very well, won lots of championships. So my hat's off to him. But that car was underpowered, so they allowed them to run a Vortex supercharger. So one of the things that they did was pulley the thing up, and they said, okay, you can only run whatever boost they told them they could run. I think it was 10 pounds or something. So you can only run, let's say, 10 pounds. Okay, we can only run 10 pounds. So we're going to limit this thing. We're going to pulley it so it only makes 10 pounds. And then they realized, okay, well, what we need to do really is we really need to have a turbo. They allowed us to have a Vortex. So what we're going to do is pull this thing up and then essentially wastegate it or blow off valve it so that it never makes more than 10 pounds. And that, and by doing that, they're able to have more boost down low, more acceleration, come out of the turn, all of, you know, more average power production is always a good thing. So that's what they did in the NSX. And it definitely works. Anytime you raise the boost, it definitely works. And I went over the problems in the video and that's this, that, the, the blower manufacturers don't really want you to do that. They don't want you running the blower at maximum impeller speed and then bleeding off the excess. They would much rather have you put a restrictor on the inlet side. In fact, Paxton used to do that on their Novi 2000 kits for the Mustangs. They used to put a restrictor on the inlet side so that it would clip the boost kind of at the top. It wouldn't do the same thing that opening a bypass valve does, but it would still limit the boost production. We did that on uh, my buddy Bernie Van Hammond and I um, designed, developed a, a supercharger kit for Stillen, the guys that were doing all the Nissan stuff, for their Maxima. They, we built a supercharger kit for those guys. And the problem is it made too much power. We took them for a ride and they're like, whoa, whoa, that's way too much power. <laughs> and we put the biggest pulley on the blower that would fit because it, it was a reverse rotation blower and we had to make it all packaged and all that stuff. And so it was a lot of things going on there. But we, and the way that we limited it, it was to put a very restrictive air filter on it. We ended up putting an air filter on it and then just started taping it up. 
so that it had an opening in the air filter that was about this big. It, during acceleration, it would actually collapse the air filter, um, but it would still get enough air to make good power. And so we ended up just sourcing an air cleaner that would work, and, and, that, and that all worked out very well. So if you restrict the inlet air, you can restrict the ultimate power out of the blower. That works fine, too. But the bypass valve idea is really cool. Like, let's make a lot more low-speed power, and then let's clip it at the top. But there, there are a couple of problems with that, and I showed this in the video. One is that you can't increase the boost dramatically at 2,000 RPM. No matter how, if you spin the blower so that it's at its maximum recommended impeller speed, now racers go beyond that all the time. They also break the blowers all the time. If you run the maximum impeller speed and then you open the bypass valve, what a lot of guys don't realize is that you're still having to flow all of that air. In fact, if you open the bypass valve, the blower is actually going to flow more air doing that than it would at just whatever the maximum boost you're, let, let's say you're setting it for 15 pounds. If you just pulled it so the thing made 15 pounds at whatever engine speed that is, it would flow less air than it does the other way by allowing it to overspeed and then opening the bypass valve because it will flow a lot more air at a lower boost level at a higher at a higher impeller speed. So blower guys, uh, the manufacturers don't like when you do that. One, you're running up near the recommended RPM range of the thing. And, it's, and that's not just load and, and boost. It's actually, you know, it, the bearing is designed to, to run a certain speed. So they don't, and, and the impeller and all that, all of those things were designed for certain speeds in mind. So they don't want you doing that. They also don't want you opening the bypass valve. Um, and the, the other problem that we had with that, and I covered this in the video, is that when you're running higher speeds and flowing more air, you have more parasitic loss associated with processing that air. That's still work that it's doing. It's not working against the boost, but it's still having to flow a lot of air because it's still spinning a lot of RPM. So even though you're allowing a lot of that to escape, it has to process that air. That's work work requires energy. You'll see that in parasitic loss. And so it's it's not good from a number of standpoints, but it is good from the fact that you'll be able to make more power down low. Um, and we've seen these systems work. The thing is that, and I showed this in a video, that it's really hard to, because there's a limit to how much how much RPM you can run on these blowers. And if you hit that maximum RPM, at whatever the maximum engine RPM is, you're just not going to be able to get a big change down in lower engine speeds in the impeller speed because it's about a, from 2000 to 6500, it's about a 3.25 like multiplication ratio. So at 2000 RPM, you're just never going to get a lot of boost. You'd have to speed the thing way up to get a dramatic change in boost down there. It's just not going to happen. So it's difficult, if not impossible, for the centrifugal blower to make a kind of turbo curve where it's just flat and at 10 pounds or 15 pounds or whatever number you select all the way across. It's just not going to do that. That's not to say that it's not good and it doesn't work and doesn't make a lot of power. It's just that you can't expect one thing that was designed to do one thing. You can't say, okay, I want you to do something else that this other thing was designed to do. It's just really not going to happen. And hopefully I didn't make all of the centrifugal manufacturers mad and all the people to have them. Because like I said, I'm one of you. I, I had a Bortec on my Mustang for years and years and years. And, and, and it worked very well. Um, right now I'm working on the next video coming up. So give me, I, what I want you guys to do is let me know what you guys think. Give me some ideas on some new videos that you want coming up. I'm going down. I was heading down to do 38, more 3800 testing. I think that the stuff from ZZP is probably there or well on its way. Um, I have a lot of testing to do on that. I also have testing to do on the um, 5.9 liter Dodge. So we're going to run boost on that. Not a lot. I mean, even if it's seven pounds or whatever, it will still work good. Also, what you guys thought of all of the torque stuff that I did. 500 Cadillac, the Buick, the little 4.8, all of that stuff. So let me know what you guys are thinking. And then we'll go ahead and, and answer some questions. Um, a lot of people have brought up the CVT system, which is a good idea. Would twin prochargers help with low speed? They will supply more airflow 
down low, um, and that and that can help. Same thing with twin, um, you know, any kind of twin centrifugal deals. We ran twins uh, torque storm superchargers on the six liter, and it definitely doubles the airflow. So the boost will definitely go up down low. But again, they're they're both going to have a rising curve. It's just that you have more airflow and and more complexity. Uh, can you run a centrifugal blower and turbos? Yes, you can. That's been done quite a, quite a bit. But I don't know, again, I don't know why you would. Um, you'd be better off running a positive displacement blower that has immediate boost response and then the turbo to help the turbo spool up. Uh, hear me out, a 3.5 EcoBoost build. I don't have any of those. 440 Mopar, I do like those <laughs> a lot. As a matter of fact, I need to build one. I have a whole trick flow top end kit for a 440. I want to build a stroker. Ideally, I'd like to do a 400. I'd like to find one of those. But a 440 would also work and build like a 500 inch deal with the trick flow heads and the cam and the intake and all that stuff. I want to do that. And I do like the 440s. I think they work very, very, very well. I just think the problem with the 440, and I've mentioned this, and it always makes the Mopar guys mad, but a stock 440 head, almost all of them, they're basically small block heads. I mean, they don't flow very well, not anywhere near what a big block Chevy head flows, and not anywhere near what a 426 Hemi head flows. Uh, straight six versus V6, it just depends on what individual things you're talking about. It, you need to be specific on the, the V6 you're talking about versus the straight six. The configuration has very little effect. Uh, love the torque content. Thank you very much. There's a very, very mean twin charge Mustang that runs a pro charger with twins for cool factor. Gave me original. The twin charging a deal is very cool, but I like I said, doing it with a centrifugal blower and then turbos is, is, is kind of silly. Um, you'd be much better off doing twins feeding some sort of roots blower like a kong blower and then two big 78 millimeter turbos or whatever that would be cool uh more v 4.3 liter v6 please i i do like the 4.3 liter v6 I'd, I'd like to do more of those i kind of like those motors uh james i'd like to see a turbo versus magazine 2300 or 2650 test or turbo versus lsa blower i think i know what the results will be the cadillac blower is disappointing um yeah, if you look at the modular Ford deal, that that was a 122 versus turbos, and it's just not, it's really not even close. I mean, there's so much drive loss associated with driving those blowers. And, and, and as we go higher and higher in horsepower, there's more drive loss for those blowers. So the, the disparity between a turbo and the blower are going to be dramatic. Uh, stroke of 383 with 440 heads. But a 440 head is not very good. It's a factory head is not very good. It, it needs to be you what what it wants to be is a 440 is already more cubic inches than that cylinder head wants to flow and support. It'd be better like that's why a 383 and Dulcich has always told me that the 383 Mopar motor is the best engine ever made. <laughs> He's obviously a Mopar guy, which is awesome. Dulcich is awesome. Um, but they they would be much better a stock set of heads would be much better on a 383 than a 440 because a 440 will make more torque because it's bigger, but they just don't make a lot of power because they don't have a lot of head flow. <laughs> Donovan, a 440 still puts out 480 foot pounds. They're rated at 480 foot pounds. I'm debating on using a turbo I got from a friend for my 5.9 Magnum. It's a Cat S300G. 68 millimeter front and 73 millimeter backside. That'll be good. It, it, it's not going to make a lot of power, but um, it should work well. It should be pretty responsive. Uh, Frankenstein 3, how buildable is a 5.9 liter out of a 1998 Jeep Cherokee Limited? So that's, a, that's just a 360 Magnum motor, right? I'm looking to pick up a Procharge F1R build to put together. That that will all work. You can you can make lots of power out of the Magnum or the LA motor if you do a lot of stuff to it. Uh, 
So, Admiral, you think a straight six is better than a D6 just, just because a straight six is better inherently somehow? Uh, I would disagree with that. So, Tim, you want to see more Omni stuff? I, I will. As soon as the motor gets done, we're going to run a bunch of stuff on the engine dyno. And I will do chassis dyno stuff as well. I personally think the Magnuson blower and turbos are the best two forms of force induction. Uh, a roots blower like a Magnuson is not nearly as um, efficient as a twin screw is, but it's but it's good for covering the marketplace, that's for sure. Uh, Philip, do you ever do destructive testing? You mean like the Big Bang stuff? Or like the show that I designed called Wheel of Death, <laughs> where we figured out how ways to destroy things. Joseph, what's better, turbo or roots blower for a BP three fifty five? And do need to fix the rings? Uh, ring gap is necessary on any boosted application. And a turbo will always make more power than a roots blower at any given boost level. The roots blower will probably be more responsive down low, though. I've always been curious about flat plane cranks. There's no reason to do that other than maybe you like the sound of a flat plane crank motor. Philip, five buttons don't work on my keyboard. Well, that's a kind of a bummer. James, can't wait for the Turbo 3800 test. Me either. I think that'll be fun. Nothing beats the leaning tower of power. <laughs> Slot sixes are good, but they're they're not like a new BMW motor or a an Atlas or any kind of four valve deal. Alan, will a 228, 232 cam and L92 heads run on an LQ4 short block while the pistons need valve release? A 228 cam should fit fine on that. Is it safe to bore an LS, an L33 motor 20 over? Yes, that's fine. 95, 345, 7 stroker, will a B303 plus cam work? Yeah, a B303 is going to be kind of small for a. Um, 347, and it's not a great cam anyway. There are much better choices, but it will go in there and it will make power. <laughs> Admiral, you're thinking about stuff way too much. Look what, look what Mahovitz is doing with the texted blocks. Burn, so the 340 and the 383 are the best Mopar engines ever. <laughs> the Wheel of Death. It might be hard to find, but the if you do a search for it, you might find some of the episodes. Could you use EcoBoost style turbos on a small box Chevy? You could. They're going to be kind of small, though, I think. Mopar Performance Aluminum Cylinder Head Stage... Ooh, Stage 7, even better than the Stage 6. Max Wedge, $1,200 at Jags. That's funny that you'd think I would be able to buy $1,200 cylinder heads. Turbo Monza, you think 28 thousandths is enough top gap for a Forge Piston 383? Yeah, it probably is. Uh, no, not for, not for 1200 wheel horsepower. I would go bigger than that. Uh, turbo Monza. So I'm going to eight speed swap my 2015 Ram. All the programming is in the BCM. It should actually be a pretty easy swap, but Hellcat car trans or trans truck. I, I don't have any idea about the trans swaps or factory ECUs or any of that stuff. Hey, 
Admiral, I missed your super chat. Let me see. Let me let me scroll back there, man. I did. I did miss. I answered that. Would twin pro chargers help with low speed? Yeah, I did. I, I got that. I got you. You know. Um, Mahovitz Mex doesn't do coyote. He all, all of his drag race blocks have all been Texas blocks, not coyote stuff. He's making coyote blocks, but that's not what he used when he was drag racing. Can cylinder head flow limit our RPM? Yes, it can. I want to put twin screws on a 351 Cleveland. What size screws? I don't know what size screws you mean, but if you, it, the size blower that you're going to get, like if it's a Kenny Bell or Whipple, is going to be dependent, just like with a turbo selection, on what kind of power you want. So if you want 600 horsepower, then you pick a 600 horsepower blower. If you want 1200, then you pick a 1200 horsepower blower, and so on and so on. All right, James, let me know how the Turbo TBSS does. What's the best piston and rod to use with boost? We like using the stock ones from the wrecking yard. They work really well. Um, if you want forge ones, there's a lot of good forge ones. And again, it depends on if you're talking about 1,000 horsepower or 1,500 or 2,000 or 2,500 or whatever the number is. No, he hasn't run his car in a long time, but all the stuff that he did on the 4.6 was all, none of it was Coyote. He didn't really even like the Coyote. So what turbo combo to make an LV3 be a late model 3.5 EcoBoost? I don't think that would be very hard. The LV3 as an NA motor already has a lot of power. Look at the rated power outputs between those, and you realize that you don't need too much boost on an LB3 to make more power than um, a 3.5 EcoBoost. What's your favorite drag strip? I'm not a drag strip guy, so I you, you'd be better off. You'd be much better off asking me what my favorite road race course is because I've done a lot of that. How much gap would you do for the power level? I would do 30 thousandths at least, um, and it depends on what board it is, but. But seven or seven and a half thousandths per inch of bore. Do you like frozen boost intercoolers? I've never tried them other than I think maybe um, the motor that I did for Finnegan, I think had one of those box deals that you put on top of the high ram. I want to put a supercharger on a gold wing. That would be good because every motorcycle needs more power. Uh, Admiral, he, all of his stuff in his drag race car, as far as I know, was none of it was ever 5.4. It was all 4.6, which we kept telling him, make the motor bigger. It will make response rate better. You could put bigger turbos on it, but he wouldn't do it. He would only do 4.6 stuff. Uh, Philip, question for the future. If you would build a test chassis with built-in equipment... How would you go about it? I don't I don't know what the question is. Kind of would like to see you drive engines with test data to go over after. You mean to drive in a car or something? I'm not really sure what you're talking about there. Uh, what size twin turbos for 351 Cleveland? George, you just need to let me know what power output you have. Um, twin GT35s will take you to more than 1,000 horsepower, and they would be fairly responsive on a 351 Cleveland, especially a modified one, or 3076s, that kind of thing. Overbuilt in the house. Uh, let's see. Richard, do you do anything with compound superchargers with no turbos? I've never run one supercharger into another that I can remember. I think the guys from Vortec did it way back, blowing a Vortec into the Eden supercharger on a Lightning. But I have i don't think I've ever done that. What should I expect on a 460 with Edelbrock with a thumper cam and some Edelbrock heads? I don't know which Edelbrock heads you're talking about or what the rest of the combination is. But, uh, okay, what's your favorite road course? Um, I, think, I think probably... Um, Maybe Road America.
uh, was thinking of getting their air to water drag kit, which comes with a five gallon ice tank. It's rated for 1500 horsepower. <clears throat> the cores seem to be fairly good size. Um, and we've made the cores that we use, like we probably use, we might use twice as much core as that for, for 1500 horsepower, but I've never seen their discharge temperatures or their flow rates. But if you can run ice water in it, it's really a good deal. I mean, Uh, T-Bird Boss, I think you guys asked this question last night about wet flow versus dry flow. I've never done any wet flow stuff, so I don't know anything about it. I think that head flow is way overrated anyway in terms of all it tells you is a potential power output. It doesn't actually tell you what the head does, which is why in a lot of cases we would do, whenever we do a head test on a motor, I almost always incorporate head flow so you can see what that is. But very rarely do people take full advantage of whatever the head flow number is. So let's say that the head will flow 300 CFM. Well, if you, depending on what motor you put that on, it might only make 400 horsepower. It might make 500. It can certainly support 600. And if it's on a really good motor, it can support a lot more than that. It can support closer to 700. But the guy has to be really good at building the motor. So that's why the head flow thing is not is only an indication. <laughs> if you hit it, uh, let's see. Uh, the old road course at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. So are you talking about Casey? Are you talking about the one outside the stadium? Because I've run on that a lot. Um, and I've also run on the inside one. Can we get some road race suspension setup videos? I don't have a vehicle really to set up. The cars that I've set up is a, a that I helped set up, uh, World Challenge, Mustangs, and then the U.S. Touring Car Del Sol that I won the championship in, those kinds of things. But it's not terribly difficult, though. It just means that you pay attention to detail and you set the car up before it goes out to run and you're not doing your tuning at the track. Uh, Stubby, I, I agree that would be a good test. He said, I, I'd be interested in a drag test in a car or the same motor or turbos versus roots versus centrifugal or traction is issue and you might have to regulate power off the line. I, and I've talked about that many times, especially with the centrifugal, especially at real high horsepower levels, like, you know, the guys that are doing street outlaws or those kinds of things where they have an overabundance of power and they have to detune the motor because, because of the available traction on the, on the, the track surface. So if you have more power than you can use, having less there and having a rising boost curve like a centrifugal does can actually be fairly beneficial. Scott, what about different cylinder heads requiring different ignition timing? That That's that's certainly true. I mean, we, we see that all the time. I don't know about the 4V versus 3V versus 2V. I, I'd have to go back and look and see what the timing was on those. But we know that the different heads will require different timing. I mean, you take a look at an LS, a 706 head definitely wants a less timing than a 317 head does. Yes, everybody hit the like button. 151 and 60, that's not a really very good thing. Uh, how much power can a stock 383 Mopar crank and rods handle since they are steel? A lot, obviously, if we, if you if if the LS stuff that's cast is any indication that we made fifteen hundred with. Have you come across dudes that converted their Mustang from McPherson trucks to double A arms? Yeah, when we were running World Challenge, guys did that. Have you done any testing on the new Toyota 5.7? I have not. Have you run Button Willow by Bakersfield? Yes, many, many times. I, I do like Button Willow. It's a good track. 
I've run the tracks I've run are um, Button Willow, Willow Springs, Thunder Hill in California. I've run a couple of tracks out in Phoenix, PIR and Firebird, I think. Um, I ran a Dallas street course. I ran the Long Beach Grand Prix course. I ran um, Road America, Road Atlanta, Lime Rock, um, Most Port. What was the one? Uh, Bowmanville up in Canada or Shannonville, I think is what it was called. Um, where else have we run? Las Vegas, the both uh, the the road course outside the track and the one inside the track. We've run um, the track at uh, not Arundel Fontana. We've run the road course there. Um, so we've run a couple of road courses. Let's see. Richard, what size would you recommend for a four liter BMW to make 450 at the most? Keep everything else close together. Uh, the GT45 is probably good for a four liter V8 on the BMW. And I've run a lot of go-kart tracks since two, two lo like little local ones. Admiral, don't you think there's a good reason to take a Mustang from Struts to L SLA? If you want that kind of thing, you use a Panther platform on the early VIX. Um, a double arm suspension has a much better camber curve than a Strut does. We we had to put a lot of like um, negative camber, static negative camber in a Strut suspension in the in the front of our Mustangs because they just even though we had. Um, uh, we, we basically had everything done to the strut suspension that we could do. We had roller bearing control arms and we had, um, you know, we had a ton of stuff done, to it, but the thing was still, we had lots of, we had really stiff uh, springs on it so that it didn't roll that much. But even then you had a lot of negative camber, probably had three or three and a half degrees of negative camber built into it so that the thing would use all the tire and a, like a Corvette front suspension that's a double A arm had a much better camber curve than we did, and they handled better than a Mustang did. Uh, how laggy do you think a cast 7875 with a 96 AR and a three inch downpipe would be? I don't know about the three inch downpipe, all the rest of it I think would work just fine. Have you ever built a five cylinder motor? I've never assembled one, but I built four cylinders and six cylinders, so you know it's kind of right in between. Yeah, Joe said, don't be lazy. Hit the like button. Doesn't take any effort. Come on, guys. Yeah, I, I if you're going to run a single turbo, James, a four-inch pipe would be much better. It, it'll make the turbo much more responsive and happier and make more power and all that. And then go like my videos. Uh, Tim, there was most part and Shannonville, Ontario. I raced at both of those. Um, I also ran, it was mo most part, I think was the, oh no, the, the other one that I raced at up in Canada, I liked most part and I liked Shannonville, but also Trois Rivières or three rivers. Um, I actually did very well. That's where we borrowed a motor from one of the, <laughs> one of the people that supported the guys from bear racing. They were just fans of bear racing and he had a Mustang at home and we were able to borrow the guy's motor out of his car and put it on a race car because we blew up our motor. And I ran that. And I, I, I know I finished in the top 10. And I want to think it was like fourth or fifth or something. How about doing a 401 AMC? That would be good. Have you seen Jags release a self-learning EFI kit? No, I haven't. Uh, Richard, do you remember Detroit Dragway? I remember the Green Monster Jet Car, but I don't remember Detroit Dragway. I just not, I'm not a huge drag race person. I haven't followed that a lot.
uh, cam choice for a 351 Cleveland twin set. Twin 76 millimeters. Are you trying to make like more than a thousand horsepower, Jess? What motor gave you the worst problems? I have lots of them that I've that are broken that I didn't like. <laughs> uh, what turbo for a K24? A GT3582 is good, or a GT3076 would be good. Uh, any interest in doing other import stuff? I, I love import stuff. <laughs> Fascist pendant. You don't like that YouTube doesn't show the dislikes anymore? I don't know why they wouldn't. I, I think that that's good information. More data is always better. That helps us make a better product. <laughs> Kurt, your mom today. Tell her what's up. Kurt in Maui. Nice. 528. Just got home from work, so I always miss the first half of the show. Well, we'll have to schedule it later, or I will just have to come to Maui and then do a show for you in your kitchen. As long as there's pineapple, I'm in. Have you done your testing with a ProCharger I1? I have not with the CBT, and everybody mentioned that, like, here's the cure for this, Richard. Here's the thing that you need. You need a CVT transmission in the drive hub of the blower, which is awesome. And I, many, many years ago, I asked them about using one of those. But the problem is that that sort of drive assembly is not adaptable to all the blowers. Also, there is like this many that you can count on one hand of people that have used that blower and have used the drive assembly that has an infinite ratio, essentially. So you can spin the blower at any speed. And, and while that's a good idea, it has to be computer programmed and it only works on a very, very small blower. So it's not a universal thing. And again, it's not used by very many people. It's used by a handful of people. And so it's nice as a theoretical thing, but not as an actual thing. What's the most powerful, powerful did you ever make out of a flathead port? I've never built a flathead port, so I, I haven't ever made any power out of them. Uh, have you ever seen a scat before? Yes, I've seen many of them, I, and I like them. Uh, when I was working in Huntington Beach, when I had Rammer Technology, there was a um, guy over in the industrial area that we were that had a, a bunch of the scat V4s, and we used to go over and look at them. They were kind of cool. Uh, what affects turbo spool time, compression versus ignition timing? There, you, you can't separate those things. Uh, Philip, there's a lot of production engines that I haven't been able to run that I would like to run on the engine dyno. There's the, um, backing up into my green screen here. Um, there's a lot of different ones. I'd like to run an 8.1. There's a ton of them that I would like to do. I just don't have enough time to do them all. Yeah, Scat V4, Tim, does sound kind of strange. <laughs> Yeah, Donovan, I, these um, these self-learning deals uh, with throttle body injection, I'm not a big fan. I haven't seen them work very well. Maybe there are systems that do. Um, I've never seen one be repeatable on the dyno so that it does the same thing every time, run after run. Um, I've never seen them be especially efficient at self-tuning. And the, in my opinion, if you when you like, if we take a carburetor out of the cabinet and put it on the motor, it works fine. We don't even look at the jets in the carburetor because we don't care about that. We just put it on and we know that's going to work fairly well. Oh, it's it's 11.5, so we need to take some jet out of it. And we take the jet out of it and it works fairly well. Brule always says that a carburetor is like a mechanical mass air meter. And he's right. It works really well. Um, and I've, I've yet to see a fuel-injected throttle body like four injector or eight injector, how many ever injections do you want to put in there? I've yet to see a self-learning system like that ever work as well as a carburetor. Uh, ben, you, his question is, what's the main difference between a 
BTR single turbo camshaft and a twin turbo camshaft. <laughs> I'd have to look exactly at the specs and see, but honestly, I don't think that there's a need for two of those camshafts. Um, what they're trying to do is optimize the cam specs for the reduction in back pressure that you would have on a twin system versus a single system. What they're doing and what you would see if you tested both those things NA is they're changing the NA power curve. And then that will have an effect on changing what's happening with the turbos. That's my opinion. I, I don't know why there would be a reason to have those again, unless it's for a 2,500 horsepower pro mod kind of thing. I don't remember who the, the driver of the green monster was. Uh, Leonard, I have an 06 Denali 5.3 liter. I like to improve the engine, get about 500 horsepower. Boost is the easiest thing. Admiral, any thoughts on the on the fuel tech systems? I don't think I've tested those. I like those more than the Holly. What's your favorite four cylinder? I don't have see a lot. That's that's the in my opinion. That's one of the problems with the internet is that we get fixated and we're we're in one camp. Like I'm a rotary guy, or I'm a LS guy, or I'm a Honda guy, or I'm a Nissan SR20 guy. Whatever that is, there isn't that with me. All of the motors I love and, and, they, and I want them to make more power and I like learning about that particular engine family, the things that it needs. Now, the reality is that other than learning, okay, this one needs some sort of weird O-ring between like a Honda between the, between the head and the block or whatever the deal is, or between the, I think it was between the um, cam tower and the head, you learn the little idiosyncrasies of each one of the motors and all that's good, but all the motors respond to the same thing. They want more head flow, they want more cam timing, they want more compression, they want more displacement, and they all want boost. Intake runner length does the same thing. It's all the same. And that's what a lot of guys don't realize. If they argue that a Honda motor is better than a Nissan motor, or that an LS motor is better than a Ford motor, or Coyote, or whatever, all of that is nonsense. All of them can be made to make better power. So what I look at is, whatever the starting point is of any motor, like the one liter Chevy Sprint, that thing made 70, it was rated at 70 horsepower with boost. So not starting out at a lot of power. Oh, you could put an LS in there a lot cheaper. That's great, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a guy that has a one liter Chevy Sprint motor and thinks that they're awesome and now wants to make more power with that motor. That's what I like doing. And so I'm I'm every bit as enthusiastic about the Chevy Sprint motor, which I was. I did a ton of stuff to it, as I am about building a 1500 horsepower big bang kind of six liter. A lot of people get wrapped up in the big numbers, like I, I've been seeing that with the boost things and with the power things. Oh, oh, you know, I I put a if I put a video up about a 347 stroke or Ford, and I post it like on Facebook on the Ford you know, groups or whatever. Oh, my 347 makes more power. Like that's a thing. Like I posted it because that's the very best I could do. And then somebody else does better. So they must be better than me. <laughs> that's not what life is. That's not at all what life is. All of the things can be better. And each one of the engines can be made better and have nothing to do with how cool the rotary is or the LS is or a Buick 454, 455, or a Chevy, or any of that stuff. Uh, JB, you want to run 11 to 1 LS7 with ring gap, 5 to 7 pounds. Yeah, that will be fine. You have to, on an autocross course, you have to worry more about... Um, oiling and stuff. I think they probably just make sure the tune's right, but I'm a car guy, just not a big fan of Fords. I don't understand why you, there's no way that you can not like a Shelby Cobra or a Boss 302. I mean, they're awesome. 
Boss 351, terrible looking car. I'm not a fan of the outside of the car. I wish that that motor was in the 1970 Boss 302 chassis or the Cobra Jet chassis or whatever. Oh, I've been left stranded a bunch of times. Best inline four has to be between a 2.3 EcoBoost and a K24. See, that's good. You like what you like, and that's fine. I have a German car with Japanese engine running Chinese and American performance parts. See? It's all one big happy family. Are Mexican 302s a good block? Yes, they are. Uh, Mike, that's just a silly comment. The best four-cylinder world is the K24, and I bet people would agree. It doesn't matter how many people you agree that agree with you on that. That's a silly statement. That's an opinion, and opinions are different than facts. And I support your opinion. You can have whatever opinion you want, and you can like the thing that you like, and I will stand side by side with you to fight for your right to have that opinion as long as you recognize it's just an opinion. And I might have a different one. Lots of other people might have different ones. And theirs isn't any less than yours. Um, so whatever they like, I would stand side by side with them. Dotson 3 liter Rebello engine. Those are kind of pricey, but yeah, needs boost. So stupid. Eight pounds in a rear mount turbo. The inline six cylinder Datsun does can definitely benefit from turbos. That works good. A three liter even better because it's got more displacement. I the the Boss 351, I think I like even more than I like the Boss 302 engine. It's it's the most powerful of the small blocks I've ever tested of the, all of the muscle car stuff. It had good heads. It had enough displacement. It had enough compression. It had it really needs more camshaft, but it had enough camshaft. It had a four barrel. It had a four barrel intake manifold, and all that worked really well. It just had a fairly heavy car, and the body style was not to everybody's liking. Auto, so you, in high school, I took a 225 Super 6. Nice. With a Pontiac pull-through turbo. Wow. Uh, Populous, if you dyno test, should you break the engine in beforehand for 1,000 miles? Um, we have a break-in procedure that we run on the engine dyno if it's a brand-new motor. We run it through two cycles normally a break in where it varies the RPM and varies the load. And we can set that for whatever combination of those things that we want. And so we always break it through it. And when Brule does, especially if he does race motors, they'll go through and reset the valve lash and do all that stuff. So all that stuff can be done in the dyno. Uh, I do, I am a big fan of the quad four stuff as well. Uh, Steve, I have an F2 Pro Charger on a 427, and the converter gets it into boost right away. Well, the converter doesn't get it into boost. All that it does is just run the RPM higher. Because a Pro Charger, even an F2, has a rising boost curve like every centrifugal blower. They all do that. 
So all you're doing is instead of starting all the way at the bottom with enough converter and enough power, you're starting here somewhere in the middle where it's already making some boost. As you go up to 7,200, it's making a lot more boost than whatever the load in point was. Yeah, the quad four made as much as 190 actually on the HO version, James. Two thousand BMW M fifty two two point five liter inline six. Um, I, I do like the BMW motors. I've I've owned a few BMWs and I really like them. They handle really well. They're well built. They're good cars. I like the motors. They make good power. <laughs> Does anyone like the Iron Duke? I, I'm definitely going to test an Iron Duke. I have to. So you like Sasquatch girls on farm trackers overbuilt. Wow. Yeah, my thoughts and prayers also out to all the, I called Brian immediately or send him a text to find out if the guys from Brian Tooley were affected by the tornado. That's some, that's some bad stuff going on, man. You hit four different states at one time. That's, that's some serious stuff. What is the best spark plug gap for boost? The best spark plug gap for boost is the one that doesn't misfire. So we normally turn the plug gap down to sub 20, 18 or 19 under high boost stuff. I haven't, Ryan, I haven't done any eco boost stuff, but you know, just turn the boost up. The 2.2 boys are putting down a thousand horsepower out of an eight valve 2.2 um, Dodge motor, probably not a thousand horsepower. No one has a boost cam for a Cleveland. Just everyone has a boost cam for a Cleveland. Just, just look at the comp cams catalog and pick the cam that you want. And guess what? That's a boost cam. Uh, Chad, you want to shoot out between a stock 5.3 and a stock 350 Vortec? I have both of those. You know, I haven't run the stock Vortec with the stock fuel injection manifold on it, but you're going to see a difference of about 50 horsepower between those two motors. Uh, what do I think about a 60 Ford Galaxy? I like Ford Galaxies. A 350 might make more of a very low speed torque because it's bigger but it's not going to be close in terms of power. My 13 to 1 440 with a 254 260 cam, a triple head's only made 367 on a chassis dial. That seems really low. That's a big cam for a 440 with trick flow heads. That thing should be a hundred up from where you're at. We need a stock six liter. I have that versus a stock five, four, three valve. I don't have that. We need an 8.1. I don't have that versus a three V Triton V10. I don't have that. So I only have one of those things. Have you ever caught a motor on fire? Yes, I have a couple of times. Eight point one, early two thousand Chevrolet. Would you be interested in future testing? I do want to run an eight point one at some point. Two fifty four, two sixty at fifty 
in a 440 is a pretty big cam. Have you had many blo motors blow up on the dyno? I have. We've broken motors on the dyno, you know, more than a few times. We try not to do that. Sometimes when we were when I was doing the um, wheel of death and we're doing the big bang, we're trying to get to a point where the thing, you know, self destructs. So that's our own fault. Uh, Richard, say hi. I have a good friend with me, Vaughn. She's a head turner. <laughs> hey, Vaughn, what's up? Sorry, I meant boosted power on both of them with stock bottom ends. Chad, what was your question? Do you think a six, uh, Richard, do you think a Eagle six inch H beam rod with 8740 716 splits will hold up to 1200 wheel horsepower? If you look at what we've done on the LS stuff with stock rods and stock rod bolts, I would say the answer is yes. I used to run 2050 oil and never blew a motor. So you think that the fact that you're running a more viscosity is, has saved the engine? That's not what saved the engine. Uh, let's see. Top five other guys' motors you haven't run yet. I'd like to run... And this will be the last question for tonight because I got to get going. My lovely wife is waiting for me. I want to run an old quad four, which I think is awesome. I'd like to run a lot of the import motors, the BMW, uh, Lexus, Nissan motors. Um, an 8.1 is definitely high on the list. I want to run the 8.1 big block Chevy. Um, I need to run a big block Ford with boost, obviously, a 460 or a 429. And then um, the Atlas. <laughs> I've run that a couple of times, but I haven't run it all the way up. Like I'm looking forward to doing the big bang on the Atlas and find out how much power that can actually make. Especially now because Calvin has run his up and he's made lots of power. They ended up blowing it up. But um, I think that there's more there because they didn't put ring gap in it. And, then, and I'm sure that that's what they heard. I mean, when you hurt something on a motor that you're running boost on and you haven't put ring gap in it, I'm sure that you hurt a ring line. I was going to see another cool question, but alas, it's Saturday night. It's time to go. I got to get going. I got stuff to do. Thank you guys all for supporting the channel. More videos coming. If you haven't, make sure to check out all the videos that I posted recently and all the torque stuff that we did. And obviously the most recent one on the centrifugal blower and why you probably can't make it into a turbo, but that doesn't mean it's not awesome because any kind of boost is definitely awesome. All right, you're older. <laughs> Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. Thank you guys all for showing up. I will see you tomorrow.